The Force is with you, young Skywalker. But you are not a Jedi yet. What we need to do is to take this raw film, these shots, and try to find the best parts of each one and then put them in the right order and get them to be the right length. And I think that's what editing is. Bueller? Here. Anderson? Anderson? Here. Bueller? 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 Um, he's sick. My best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows this kid is going with the girl who saw Ferris pass out at 31 Flavors last night. I guess it's pretty serious. Wake up! Don't move or I'll cut it. Jenny, what are you doing? I'm bleeding. Oh my God, I'm bleeding. And I can help you. Hi everyone, it's Artif the Cinema Guy and welcome to episode 17 of Zebra Spotlight. My guest is an Academy Award winning American motion picture editor. He is also the author of A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far Far Away, My 50 Years Editing Hollywood Hits, Star Wars, Carrie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Mission Impossible and more. After graduating from Columbia University in 1966, he began to pursue a career in editing. In the late 60s, whilst editing trailers in New York City, he was introduced by his brother to then-unknown filmmaker Brian De Palma. Their collaboration has yielded 11 feature films, including the classic Blowout. In 1978, he won the Academy Award for Best Film Editing for his work on Star Wars. He was also the first person to win the Saturn Award for Best Editing twice, first for Star Wars in 1977, and then Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol in 2011. During his career, he's edited over 40 feature films, including The Empire Strikes Back, Planes, Trains and Automobiles, Footloose, Steel Magnolias, Ray, and one of my all-time favourites, Falling Down. It's my honour and privilege to welcome Paul Hirsch. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It, it doesn't do you justice. I mean, you are a veteran in the Hollywood film industry. I'm truly privileged that you, you've taken time out to discuss things with me. You know, everyone edits videos these days, you know, people take videos and puts things on Instagram and all sorts. But let's go to professional motion picture editing. In, in your opinion, in your definition, um, what do you do? What, what is the role of the film editor? It's interesting that you should ask that because I was just talking with a colleague yesterday and saying that today, that, that editing used to be very sort of arcane, uh, profession. I used to call it, when I met a fellow editor, I would say, oh, uh, a fellow practitioner of the black arts, because nobody really knew what it was. But today, everybody knows what it is. I mean, everybody understands editing. Everybody has an editing tool in their hands 24 hours a day. Uh, <laughs> I'm reminded of, <laughs> of a time I was working with Robert Redford, and uh, I helped out on a picture of his he said to me, he says, you know, what we need to do here, and he said this in all seriousness, and first of all, I have to say I have enormous respect for the man. He's done more for the art of cinema than, you know, more than, you know, the top 100 executives you can name. But um, he said to me, in all seriousness, he said, what we need to do is to take this raw film, these shots, and try to find the best parts of each one and then put them in the right order and get them to be the right length. And I said, yes, yes, that's right. And I think that's what editing is. I there mean, you go. in a reductive sense. You, if, if people stay to the credits of the film, often they'll see um, who the film's been edited by and often you'll see the um, initials ACE. Um, could you elaborate on what the what this illustrious uh, group of artists is and, and how you get to have that accolade? Yeah, ACE stands for American Cinema Editors. It was founded in 1950 
the purpose of it was to raise public, uh, raise the profile of the profession and to uh, increase the public's awareness and, uh, and understanding and appreciation of the art of editing. In, in your opinion, particularly in, in, in modern film, can you learn the art of editing or can you become a great editor in Hollywood, in Hollywood without joining? Oh, yeah. No doubt. I mean, you have to have, uh, so there are requirements for membership that have to do with longevity rather than quality. You have to have edited so many feature films and, and uh, you know, so it's it's really a sort of a uh, an honorary thing. It's not, mm -hmm. I don't know, I have mixed feelings about ACE after our names because it implies that editing is technical somehow. But uh, very little of editing is technical. It has to do more with, um, at least the way I operate, it has to do more with intuition than, than analysis and, and uh, understanding some set of rules or anything. The tools are pretty, you know, the tools have gotten more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's all about choosing the right bits of film and putting them in the, in the right order and making them the right way. In fact, in, in the art of storytelling, um, in your experience, in, in your opinion, <clears throat> what would you say are the key elements? Uh, you've listed some of them there, obviously, but what would you say the key elements in great editing? And, and with that I'm in mind... Timing. Um, timing. And could you elaborate on examples of great editing, excluding your own work, of course, versus poor editing, even if you could possibly give some examples. Great editing delivers the emotions that the filmmaker desires. So you come away from a film that's well edited, you were excited at the right moments, you were surprised at the right moments, you were touched at the right moments, you were deeply moved, you know. Uh, there's no feeling of, let's get on with it, or wait, I didn't understand that, or you know, uh, a friend of mine who recently passed away, a man named Don Camburn, wonderful editor who edited Easy Rider mm -hmm. to teach editing. And he had one basic, he had two basic rules. Don't uh, bore the audience and don't confuse the audience. And that's, that was his, those were his guiding principles. And um, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Um, I recently watched a show on television that I thought was poorly edited. And the reason I thought it was poorly edited was that each time an actor delivered their lines, there would be a pause before they said the line and then they would speak the line and then the editor would hang on the shot a fraction more to give it a sort of a meaningful look afterwards. And then they would cut to the person who's playing the scene with this first actor and you would cut and then watch their reaction to the line. Mm -hmm. And then react first, and then they would speak, and then you'd hold on them for another beat, and you cut back, and there'd be a reaction to what they had just said. And it was uh, a uh, plethora of pauses. And mm -hmm. I think that pauses, I've said, are like salt. You know, you don't want to do away with them entirely, but you want to use, use them sparingly. So... Um, you have to choose your moments when the when to pause. You can't pause on every cut. It's deadly. It's like it's like putting little uh, lead pellets in every pocket of your clothing, and eventually you sink from the accumulated weight of all the little lead pellets. So. <laughs> That's a, a very stark example. So, for all of you uh, uh, budding editors out there, these these are gems of, of wisdom. Um, coming on to uh, I mean, let's talk about Star Wars. For filmmakers or, or uh, wannabe filmmakers, or actors, it's a lot of people's dreams to just work on a Star Wars film. Now, you were there from the inception. Um, what was it like working on a, on a classic Star Wars movie with George Lucas? And did you have any ideas to how epic this trilogy would become? I was not there quite at the beginning. I was the fourth editor hired on the film. The first editor was let go at the end of principal photography. And at that point, George's wife, Marsha Lucas, who was a fine editor in her own right, had edited um, 
excuse me, she had worked with uh, Marty Scorsese on Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore and Taxi Driver. And uh, she had not intention, uh, intended to work on the film originally, but seeing how the first cut looked and how much work needed to be done to repair the damage, uh, she agreed to come on to the picture. And um, they hired uh, an excellent West Coast editor named Richard Chu, who had worked on the conversation with Walter Murch and on uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and went on to uh, edit some wonderful films. He cut Risky Business and I don't know all his credits, but he's a great editor. And the two of them were working on the film when I got a phone call from Marsha saying, we need more help. Can you come help us on the film? And that's how I got involved. So I was not there right at the start. Mm -hmm. I got there at a point where it was like uh, laying track in front of a locomotive. Everyone was working really fast and hard and long hours to get the job done. And we collaborated, the three of us collaborated for three months um, to get the picture ready to show to the studio around Christmas time. I thought I thought I would be going home at the end of that. Marty Scorsese had been shooting a picture called New York, New York with Robert De Niro and, um, of course, her name escapes me now, uh, Judy Garland's daughter. Marsha had, had, been, had worked with Marty before, and Marty's editor passed away suddenly and unexpectedly, and he asked Marsha to come in and take over the picture. So she uh, asked George if that was okay with him. He said, okay. I says, I really only want to work with one editor from now on. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be Paul. So uh, I got extended. I thought that Richard, having been hired before me, would be the logical uh, choice. But the he had the same deal I had, which was just to the end of the year. So um, anyway, George picked me. And, and I was the editor for the last five months. We had no idea. You know, first of all, there was no sense of working on the, you know, some, uh, I forget how you characterized it, some epic, uh, some, what was the words you described? So the, as... the, the, the epic trilogy, the, how, how great and <clears throat> how great, how big this would become. At that point, it was, it was, to me, it was the most expensive film I had ever worked on. So that was exciting. Mm -hmm. But it was really pretty wacky. There was this, you know, walking uh, dog with, with ammunition on his chest and and robots who didn't speak, you know, only spoke in sound effects. And to me, it was wonderful, but there's no sense of, oh my God, this is a classic. There was no mm -hmm. sense of classic. It was sort of a, uh, you know, George was in his thirties. Uh, I was in my thirties. We were just starting out basically on our careers. So we were just yeah. trying to get the job done. I mean, when I met with George for the first time, he showed me around ILM and I said, George, I have a confession to make. He said, what's that? I said, I've never worked on anything this big before. Mm -hmm. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Nobody ever has. <laughs> he said, you'll be fine. Film is film. You'll be fine. Yeah, so uh, that's what it was like. And then, you know, we worked six days a week, uh, sometimes seven. And uh, my daughter was born in the middle of this, my first child. So that was exciting. Um, and we moved from San Francisco down to Los Angeles for the sound mix. So there was a lot going on in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and I said the rest is history. Then you went on to work on uh, Empire, which is arguably probably the greatest sequel of one of the greatest films in movie history. Thank you. I think it's between Empire and Godfather 2. Ooh, tough choice. Tough choice. Both pick. of them are fabulous. You don't have to choose. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know if you, uh, I know famously you hardly ever watch any of your films ever again after working on it, but I don't know if you've seen any of the, the new batch of, of the Star Wars films or any of the, the, the TV shows that Disney Plus produces. Yeah. Uh, have you got any sort of... Uh, Favorites from any of those of the of the new ones? No. Fair enough. Um, I, I think what's what's been 
leached out of the films over the years is George's sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Star Wars is a very funny film. And uh, that humor has sort of gone away. It's become very self serious. Mm -hmm. I lament that. I think it's not good for the for the for the movies. I think they're they're less enjoyable because of that. Mm -hmm. you know, and if if three PO hadn't been in that first film, it would have been a disaster. You know, he's the comic relief in a way. Paradoxically, he's the uh, character that audiences connect with in the most human way. You know, that he has he expresses the feelings that. Uh, the heroic characters can't. He's a wonderful character, and and uh, the, the more they've gotten away from from comedy, I mean, you know, even Empire was, you know, Kirsch understood that when he directed. Mm -hmm. Empire. He he worked very hard to develop a comic duo relationship between Han and Chewie. When they're mm -hmm. working, mm -hmm. Chewie drops a box of tools on Han's head, or you know. I mean, there's there's a lot of comic stuff in there that's essential for these movies. They can't they can't take themselves too seriously, and I think that's that's what I find uh, uh, disappointing about the mm -hmm. way the franchise has evolved. I like to say we started out as the rebels, and we've become the empire. And, and, and talking of, of, of rebels, and, and, and you've probably heard this question so many times. Well, I've got to ask you, uh, in, in your profession, and I've got my own opinions. Um, the, the whole Han Han shoots first thing. Uh, you know, when I was a kid and I watched Star Wars, Han Solo, the gunslinger, he just shoots Greedo, job done. And then when these special editions came out, I know there were fans across the world who, who you know, obviously are very upset of these special edits. Um, what, what's your opinion? No opinion. <laughs> I the first got... one was, 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 you got it right the first time, is that right? I didn't see anything wrong with it. Agreed. Moving on. <laughs> um, now, the, the, the answer to the, to the next question is probably obvious, but I wanted to know your, your input on this. Um, particularly for a movie collectors when they buy these on physical media, often you'll see you know, the, the new release to director's cut or the, the previously unreleased cut of this film um, that, you know, that was shown in theatres. Um, obviously, there's a time element that when, when commercial movies are made uh, and they need to, you know, the studios may say, look, that's just too long, that's good for theatre, and we'll release the longer extended version for you know, enthusiasts of the film on physical media. But what's your take on, on the various different cuts of the film, you know, Things like Blade Runner, for instance, or uh, the new Francis Ford Coppola, um, uh, you know, reordering of the Godfather series. What, what's your take in, as an editor in terms of these different cuts of, of movies? Well, I never want to see a director's cut of anything. I like, I find that the director's cuts that I have seen have been disasters. I saw a cut of Apocalypse where they put back the French plantation scene, and I thought, oh God, they, they should have left it out. You know, they, it just drags the picture down. Mm -hmm. And that's the case with director's versions. They're too long. Somebody gave me a director's cut of The Wild Bunch, mm -hmm. one of my favorite movies. And I started to watch it, and I thought, what is this? This is horrible. I couldn't put my finger on it, but I thought, this is not, this is not good. So I think that directors remember how much work they put into a scene, how difficult it was to achieve, how, you know, what lengths they went to to get this or that and the other thing. And, you know, there's the old editors saying, murder your darlings, and they, they can't murder their darlings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm or many of them can't. I, I think the discipline imposed by time limits is an aid to creativity. I think limits in general are helpful. Mm -hmm. Imagine doing a painting with no, no edges. Interesting. You, know, you, you need limitations. You have to say, I have to work within this frame. Okay, how do I do that? Um, and it spurs invention, it spurs creativity. 
uh, if, if you can do whatever you want, it, it, it leads to mediocrity, I think. And, and I mean, is it known in the industry where <clears throat> directors and editors can reach logheads about how a final scene should be or how the final film should be? Or is there, you, uh, do they usually get on quite well? Well, I think the word is a mischaracterization. The, my, I feel my job is to, is to give suggestions. Everything I do is by way of suggestions. Mm -hmm. Everything I do, everything I present, this is my suggestion for how the scene should be cut. Or I say, this is my first take on it. I'm not really happy with it, you know, whatever. But uh, because of the group nature of filmmaking, one person has to have the final say. So even though there are very talented artists in the production design department and the cinematographers, editors, composers, whatever the discipline within the umbrella of filmmaking, there has to be one person through whose sensibility everything is filtered. And that person is the director. <clears throat> so they get to say yay or nay. I feel my job is to supply ideas. What if we do this? What if we do that? You don't like that? How about this? Um, you know, and then to challenge the director, why do you need this scene? Let's take it out, see what it looks like without it. Because editors have no power, nothing we say is really a threat to an intelligent director. There are stupid directors who take suggestions as threats and there are uh, psychologically damaged people who don't like anyone's idea unless it's their own. You know, so those people are not fun to work with. But I've had a lot of luck working with people who are very collaborative, appreciate my suggestions, and even when we disagree, they just say, well, I don't agree, you know. So, but mm -hmm. I feel it's my responsibility to challenge their ideas so when they go out into the world and present it to everyone, they have the confidence of knowing that their ideas has, have been tested in some, in some way that, you know, some mm -hmm. hopefully intelligent way uh, so they can feel more confident of what they present. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we don't always, dis we don't always agree, but it doesn't matter. If you have a healthy working relationship, you're going to disagree and then I say, well, fine, do it. You know, I mean, I disagreed with things that, uh, on films that I worked uh, with Brian on, and, and I was wrong. You know, you, you're not always right. Nobody's right 100% of the time. Just supply ideas. That's my job. Ideas. You're, you're very experienced, and you've had some amazing working relationships with you know, some, of the, some of the biggest um, folk in, in the movie industry. For advice to sort of young folk these days, or people wanting to get into the film industry, and, and particularly in editing, are there any other sort of gems of wisdom that you can share for, for people to really hone in on and, and, and take heed of? Yeah, I don't really know the, the world anymore. You know, I'm an immigrant from the 20th century. So I'm really a stranger in the 21st. And uh, I don't know how to advise people to get into the business. I mean, usually I tell them to get to know a young person uh, who has an entry level job because if they get promoted, they'll be asked, do you have anybody who could do the job you're doing now? And that's the way to get in. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most practical advice I can give anyone, you know, nurture relationships with people on the rung on the ladder, once, one rung ahead of you on the ladder, because you won't get your job from the editor. You'll get your job from the apprentice who's moving up to assistant. I think the very wise words and, it, and it's uh, the testament to time that that's something that that's always worked is, is uh relationships, networking, and, and I guess just being a good co-worker so people always remember you for something. Yeah, an entry-level work is 99% attitude and 1% aptitude. Nobody cares how brilliant you are. They want to know if you get the lunch there on time. There you go, everyone. Take heed. Very, words of, uh, very wise words of wisdom and experience. Um, and when they ask you for anything, say yes and don't allow any hint of hesitation when saying yes. Let's get the job first, and then if there's anything about it you don't like, you can work it out later. In a job interview, don't give them any slightest reason not to hire you. 
said, well, he hesitated a little when I asked him if, uh, uh, I don't think we can hire him. He hesitated for a second. But, you know, don't, don't let them have any excuse for not hiring you. Jump off the wall into a pit of flame, flaming gasoline. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Not a problem. And in your uh, illustrious career, um, was there anyone, any particular director or any movie maker you would have loved to have worked with or any type of project that you haven't worked on before, which you thought I would have loved to have done something like that? Well, I knew Steven Spielberg uh, early on, and uh, he asked me to work on a picture when I was cutting cat. He asked me to, if I could edit Close Encounters uh, when I was working on Carrie, and I couldn't leave Carrie, so I was, mm -hmm. I had to say no. And uh, he and I had gotten to know each other, and uh, we got along quite well. And uh, I always regretted that I never got to work with Steven. And are there any favorite, um, I guess, in the recent times, being in the last sort of decade or so, any favorite movies or TV shows? Well, yeah. I mean, a decade covers a lot of territory. I mean, yeah. What What would you say have been the highlights for you? Anything that stands out? Thinking. You know, that that was a great movie, or I'm currently watching this TV show, which I think they've done a great job. As, as I'm getting to the end of my eighth decade, my memory is not my strongest suit anymore. So uh, I can say that currently I'm enjoying, um, I recently enjoyed watching a show called Deadlock from Australia, uh, which I found, I found myself literally laughing out loud. Really funny show. Have you seen it? I've not, but I'm going to add it to my list of recommendations. At Lock with an H on the end, like Loch Ness. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a cop show, and all the cops are lesbians. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> and then I saw a show, I, I'm very much like Fleabag, uh, and I saw, saw another show recently that reminded me of Fleabag. Uh, it's written by, written by and starring a woman I'd never heard of before. It's called This Way Up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sharon Horgan is in it as well. I like everything she's in. I liked Catastrophe very much. Um, you know, in, I'm, I'm mentioning TV shows because in the last decade, as you pointed out, uh, the films that they make for theaters have been targeted at the least critical and most easily manipulated section of the audience, which is teenage boys. And as a result, we get all these superhero movies, which I don't, I don't watch, I don't see them. Mm -hmm. I saw a few at the at the outset of the onslaught. And they're so formulaic that I just I just can't, you know, I, I've lost my taste for fantasy. I'm much more interested in what goes on between people. Yeah, this way up is about a young woman who's recovering from a nervous breakdown and uh, moves to London to be near her sister. They're Irish, living in London. And it's very, very good. It's very, very good. Very well written. Casting away all the superhero movies, but obviously you've worked on uh, a couple of Tom Cruise films before. Have you seen uh, the, uh, Top Gun Maverick or the, uh, the new Mission Impossible yeah. release? Oh, they're terrific. Mm -hmm. Both. Uh, the new Mission Impossible has a lot of nonsense dialogue that, you know, I don't know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. You know, an, an enemy called the Entity. So, I don't know, you know, they have conversations about the Entity. And I, just, I don't know what they're talking about, but the action stuff was, was terrific. I think he may have been going back to the well, you know, too many times with some of this stuff that he was doing, but... But, you know, it's Tom, nobody delivers like Tom, you know, he's, mm -hmm. he's certainly uh, special. I thought the new uh, Indiana Jones picture was terrific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, uh, it really goes crazy at the end. Uh, yeah, I, thought, I enjoyed those. And um, it, it's, it's, just, it's great, I mean, obviously within, within the industry, it's, it's like, uh, chefs making you know the most amazing meals but you, you do you know always get the impression do they actually get down to sit down and really enjoy the, the food that they're cooking or they're just so busy doing things for other people so i think it's 
it's a joy to see you actually enjoying other people's artwork. Oh yeah, I'd rather, much rather see somebody else's movie than my own. <laughs> I mean, when you you've seen it so many times that you can't stand to look at it anymore. Mm -hmm. So you know, I had somebody you know like you come to me want to do a, a chat about Mission Impossible. They have a show called Light the Fuse. Watch <laughs> Light the Fuse. It's a good show. But anyway, they came to me and they said, "Do you remember?" Uh, in the first movie, something, and I said, no. <laughs> when was the last time you saw the picture? And I said, when did it come out? And they said, you haven't watched the picture since it came out? And I said, no, why would I? Not everyone likes to watch. You know, it's funny. I, I've taken up, uh, I have a new hobby. I post pictures on Facebook. I like to take photographs and I, you know, I, I go through my files and I find pictures that I think are, are nice shots, you know, and I, I like to vary them up. Sometimes they're just nature shots or sometimes mm -hmm. sculptures or, or buildings or I find I'm not, I don't take that many pictures of people or somehow like textures or colors or I don't know. Anyway, so, or interesting places I've been. So we were talking about, um, you never like to watch um, films that you've, you've worked on previously and then you can't stand to watch that. And we talked about Light and the Fuse before. So, so on Facebook, this guy was bragging on or bagging on, or I don't know what the proper expression is, but he was talking about some picture that I'd worked on and he was criticizing it rather harshly. I may have given a response and he said, well, I've seen it 50 times and I can tell you blah, blah, blah. So I thought, well, if you've seen it 50 times, we must have done something right. I mean, you know, you can't, it can't be that bad if you watched it 50 times. I mean, so. Um. You, 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 said, you said something very interesting earlier on, being a, a guest to the, to the 21st century. And of course, everyone's now talking about, you know, AI and you know, Terminators coming to, to the world and this, that, the other. And, purely out of interest, nothing to do with film editing, or but just uh, as a, a veteran in, in life who's seen so much um, transformation in the world, what, what are your thoughts on, 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 on what's going on at the moment and, and where you see things going? Well, I'm very concerned about the people driving the cutting edge of technological pro uh, progress because I don't think they pay much attention to the potential consequences of what they're doing. I think that there's a, there's a gentleman in England named Mo Gaudet. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, no, but I'm going to look him up after this show. M-O, first name Mo, last name G-A-W-D-A-T, Gaudet. He was uh, a, an engineer, a high engineer for Google for a long time and quit and has been warning about the dangers. Right. And he points out that the danger is not so much uh, that the robots are going to take over, which he thinks is inevitable. You know, my opinion is that they already have. You try to book an appointment with a repairman, you have to go through a phone tree or, you know, and then, or do it online. You can't order a plane ticket over the phone anymore. You have to do it online. There's, mm -hmm. Lots of things you must do through a website, you know, so I would say the machines already have taken over. And then you have to prove to the robot that you're not a robot. And I thought this is really insane. Um, so his concern and mine is uh, not that AI will be a danger, but that what people will do with AI is the danger. Mm -hmm. It's very concerning that um, he thought it was a catastrophe that chat GPT was put out on the internet because they wow. extremely powerful tool and made it available to all to anyone on the internet, which includes, mm -hmm. you know, teenagers who have, you know, not yet fully formed their prefrontal cortex. They have no powers of impulse control and they have, uh, 
sometimes malign tendencies, and they can do very damaging things mm -hmm. uh, with these tools. And if you put weapons, you know, a tool is a weapon. The hammer can build a house or it can murder somebody, you know, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a tool is potentially a weapon. And I don't think that the whiz kids in Silicon Valley give much thought to what's the danger of putting this out there. They clearly, they hadn't, you know, they just, let's, let's give it to so many people so that we can see what, what happens, you know, we'll take, we'll, we'll gather data from lots of sources and we'll put it out there and see what happens. And, um, I think it's extremely dangerous. I mean, it's like, uh, nuclear weapons, you know, you, mm -hmm. You can't allow just anyone to have a nuclear weapon. And in this country, I think it's, you know, I don't know what's happened to my country. They've gone crazy in the last uh, 40, 45 years. Ever since Reagan was elected, the country's been going downhill. Jimmy Carter put solar panels on the roof of the White House and Reagan had them taken off. I mean, and from then, there's been a steady decline in this country uh, through uh, one miserable presidency after another. Um, but during that time also, around that time, was the rise of the uh, the gun lobby. So that every... So there's a distortion that took place in the understanding of the Second Amendment. So that now you have situations where you have... In, there are places in the United States where it's, it's legal to carry a gun without a license. Wow. You know, so... Uh, I think it's nuts, you know, there's, but, but so the result is with all these guns, everyone's saying, no, you know, you can't infringe on, on my right to own a gun. And what happens is every single day, there's a mass shooting in the United States yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Every day, it seems like three people killed here, four people killed there. The line between uh, freedom and responsibility is going too much in the direction of freedom and we have to bring responsibility back into it. I think Chat GPT, I mean, if, if, you know, they can do very damaging things in the next election. Mm -hmm. And they do damaging things to people's trust in what they hear and read. Mm -hmm. And you, then if you can't believe a photograph anymore, if you can't believe your own eyes, then, then what are you to believe? It's very damaging. It's very, very uh, disturbing where, the way things are heading. Let's hope and pray that uh, people take heed and that people with such power do have um, take responsibility seriously. Uh, all, all we can do is hope and, and spread the word and encourage those in power to, to do what's correct rather than uh, just wield these tools uh, and see what happens without any co consideration. The Russians have the tools too. The North Koreans mm -hmm. have them. The Iranians have them. Mm -hmm. You know, they can put out all sorts of misinformation in all these uh, social media all over the world and undermine elections. And I think mm -hmm. I think there's reason to believe that they, you know, there, there's evidence that they meddled in the 2016 election. So uh, putting out these very powerful tools uh, for anyone to grab hold of is, is insane. It's, it's, Irresponsible. What well, what I've always found intriguing is is you know watching various TV shows and, and movies throughout the years where um, it looks like it's it's fictitious. What we're watching things like Tomorrow Never Dies, where you know the, the, there's a media company that produces fake news to um, influence governments and, and things like this, or whether it's Twenty Four, where Jack Bowers, you know, saving the United States from, from terrorism and then you find out that the villains are always within government and people often will watch TV shows and movies and things and, and laugh at it as entertainment and, and fictitious but I find what I find troubling is a lot of these things actually reflect the truth and they're laughing in our faces that in fact what they're portraying is the very reality that people are unaware of because they think it's from a movie. Well, the real malign influence in the United States is unchecked uh, capitalism, I think. Mm -hmm. Where you have 10 people in the United States whose combined wealth is the same as the poorest 70% of the country. 10 individuals. It's not right. If AI keeps going, you know, 
these driverless cars, for instance, if they refine that, you know, it's not there yet, obviously, but they're working on it. They're mm-hmm. going to get it right eventually, I think. And what's going to happen then? Anybody who hires a driver is going to fire them, get one of these self-driving trucks or cars. And the most common profession among men in this country, and maybe it's all workers, uh, for people who don't have a university degree, mm-hmm. is driving. Mm-hmm. Driving a truck, driving uh, delivery guys, you know, Amazon, uh, all the deliveries they make and so forth, and truck drivers, cab drivers. They're dri- driving is the one thing that anyone can do to make a living, and that's going to go away. It's going to be gone. So wow. what do you do with all those people, and how are you going to supply them with an income? You know? And if you don't give them an income, what are you going to do with millions of people who are out of work. It's a big problem. Wow. I think another book is due, Paul. No, I'm, you know, I'm just repeating what I've read, you know. Yeah. Um, Paul, thank you so much for your time. Um, I wish I could be uh, standing here at the end here. <laughs> it, it, uh, it's really an honor. And, and you know, thank you for accepting my invitation on, on Facebook of all places. Um, so thank you, uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, for allowing me to connect with Paul. I appreciate it. And uh, we wish you all the best in life and, and, and your photography. And, and anyone who hasn't read your book, please go out and go ahead and get it. Connect with Paul on, on Facebook and look at his wonderful photography. Um, thank you for everything that you've contributed to the entertainment industry for all of these years. And wish you all the best of health and every success there is moving forward. Very kind. Thank you so much.